Okay, hello. We'll go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill. Today, and this is actually the last day, I, uh, I've been co-hosting this seminar series with Giammi Shrestha, Director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office. Uh, Giammi will provide information on this series and introduce the seminar, but before she does, here are some lo webinar logistics. Uh, the present we're going to have two presentations today, so if we have time, we'll uh, be able to entertain a few questions after the first talk. Go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, and then we'll also have time at the end of the second talk for questions. Um, and if you are interested in getting a PDF copy or recording of today's presentation, we will list the relevant websites in the chat box where you can find them, as well as links to the SOCRA2 reports. Or you can contact uh, myself, tracy.gill at noaa.gov, or Giammi Shrestha, and we will be happy to send you a copy. If you are not on NOAA's weekly seminar list, but you'd like to be, please email me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov, and I will add you to the list. And now I will turn you over to Giammi Shrestha to introduce the seminar and the speaker and all the rest. Giammi? Thank you, Tracy. Um, I think we started one minute early. <laughs> so um, some people may be tricking in. All right, greetings, everyone. I am Giammi Shrestha, director of the US Carbon Cycle Science Program Office. I have been co-leading this special carbon webinar series with Tracy Gale from NOAA since February. Before today's seminar, I would like to, uh, to express uh, my sincere gratitude to Tracy Gale and NOAA for, for um, working with us uh, the last uh, 15 weeks uh, on, this, on this seminar series and for making it possible. And, and also um, uh, a lot of uh, appreciation for all speakers and participants. Today's seminar is the 16th in a 16-part se uh, series titled From Science to Solutions, the State of the Carbon Cycle, which is focused on disseminating the second step of the Carbon Cycle Report, findings in relation to current and broader societal impacts and solutions. For your future reference, the recording of all webinars in this series are available on the YouTube channel of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program. All pertinent slides and details of the webinar series are available on the program web website carboncyclescience.us. This webinar series is sponsored by the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program in partnership with NOAA. The U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program is an interagency partnership led by the Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group since 1999. We coordinate and facilitate federally funded carbon cycle research with the science community, and we provide leadership to the U.S. Global Change Research Program on interagency uh, carbon cycle science priorities and activities. For instance, we led the three-year effort to develop the second state of the carbon cycle report with over 200 experts from the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and other nations. This decadal assessment underwent a six-step formal multi-draft peer review by multiple U.S. and international experts, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the public, and 13 federal agencies and departments before its release on November 23, 2018. On the, on the occasion of Earth Day, the U.S. Global Change Research Program released a new metadata-embedded website for this special assessment. The website is carbon2018.globalchange.gov. It has enhanced search capabilities as well as content graphics and tables that are easily accessible to both general and scientific stakeholders. Today's webinar is very special because it is the final one for this Spring 2019 series focused on carbon and the state of the carbon cycle report. I, I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Kevin Gurney from Northern Arizona University will first deliver a talk on urban carbon. Immediately after that, and a few questions, I will deliver a short narrative on cows, dirt, smoke, water, a state of carbon story. First, let me introduce Dr. Kevin Gurney to you. Dr. Kevin Gurney will present an overview of Soccer 2, Chapter 4, Understanding, understanding Urban Carbon Fluxes and 
will take a deeper dive into aspects of the urban carbon cycle related to quantification of fluxes, atmospheric monitoring, and urban scale inverse modeling. Together, these elements are being conceived of as a potential greenhouse gas flux information system for cities. He will also provide a description of new and continuing efforts at the national and international scales, focusing on the urban carbon cycle and how new monitoring and modeling efforts are attempting to meet stakeholder needs both domestically and globally. I have known Kevin since his work serving on the science steering groups of the Global Carbon Project and the US Carbon Cycle Science Program over eight years ago. It's been a pleasure working with him on soccer to the past few years also. Kevin, thank you for your willingness to speak with us today. Please start your presentation now. Sure. Well, thank you to Guillaume and Tracy for inviting me to give a talk. Um, I uh, And thanks to Soccer 2 in general for the excellent work that they did. It was a pleasure being involved. Uh, as Guillaume mentioned, I'm going to talk about Chapter 4. Uh, it's important to mention my co-leads. I'll list them at the end, but my co-leads on that chapter, Patty romero Lankow at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Stephanie Pinchell at uh, UCLA. I'm going to just quickly review the highlights of the um, Chapter 4 on understanding urban carbon fluxes and then go into a little more detail on the particular piece of that topic that I've spent a bit of time on, which is systems uh, information systems measurements and modeling uh, to better understand urban carbon fluxes and hopefully be useful for both science and stakeholders. So first a few of our um, key results from the urban carbon flux chapter. Uh, it's always worth emphasizing the fact that urban areas globally and particularly in North America are the primary source of anthropogenic carbon emissions. Uh, cities are responsible for a large proportion of direct emissions. That number is difficult to quantify, but roughly speaking, it's between two-thirds and three-quarters uh, of, of the total um, carbon flux. And there are also large areas of indirect sources. So those would be emissions that are occurring outside a city boundary, but driven by, for example, let's say demand of goods and services within, um, embedded in goods and services. Um, the drivers of emissions, there are a variety of societal factors that drive urban carbon emissions, the urban built environment, the regulations and policies that shape urban form, that is the things that make up the particular land uses and their configuration within an urban area, and of course technology, things like modes of transportation or building design all play important roles. And because there's so much large-scale infrastructure in cities and is so deeply involved with the emissions profile within cities, they experience this infrastructure lock-in, which can be decisions that will dictate a certain level of emissions over a long period of time once infrastructure decisions have been made. And this plot to the right just shows um, on the x-axis, equipment lifetime, so things like power plants, transportation systems, um, ships and boats, and the the cost, the a low carbon uh, replacement cost on the y-axis, um, just showing that there's a lot of long-lived equipment that is not inexpensive to shift, and hence those decisions are both of large financial implication and have large carbon lock-in implications as well. Key challenges for studying urban carbon fluxes are building observational design systems, um, models, and integrating all of that with adequate uncertainty quantification. And then getting them all to be coherent with one another within urban areas remains an important piece of work that's ongoing. And again, I'll dive a little deeper into that topic in later slides. Also, um, cities Though many are interested in reducing greenhouse gases, it's clear that a lot of the attempts to do so have to be part and parcel of other elements that are important to cities, that is, co-benefits that might be associated with air quality, human health, things like urban heat island, and many of the other important environmental targets that cities have. 
urban methane distinct from CO2 have been poorly characterized uh, in comparison to CO2, uh, but there's been a, a tremendous effort in the last few years, both in cities and without, as many people know, to improve instrumentation, measurement, modeling tools, and a lot of interest in that problem, given that unlike CO2, it's a sometimes almost an unintended side product of activity, and hence it's important to try to stop the fugitive or unintended loss of methane from, for example, um, piping infrastructure and such within cities. And then finally, cities are important sites for policy and decision making, not only because of the magnitude of their emissions, but because of the potential autonomy they have in passing policy. However, it's always important to remember that cities, um, somewhat different from nation states, are embedded within often, most often, other levels of, of governance at larger spatial scales typically. Um, in the United States, as an example, and this is true both in Canada and Mexico, um, cities are embedded within, um, there might be counties, regional planning authorities, then states, and then of course um, nation state constraints as well. And so though they have autonomy, it's important to understand the relationships that they have to those larger scales of governance and understand the uh, uh, how to enact mitigation policy that's integrated with those other scales. There's a tremendous amount of work going on in North American cities. I know that you can't see these tables and I put them up merely to just try to show the list that we had put together uh, at the time of the soccer publication. And this list includes cities in which there is not just simple, let's say, um, self-reported inventory efforts. Many, many cities are doing that. But this is a list of cities that are having what, let's characterize it as fairly intense scientific study. Um, and even since the Soccer 2 report, um, this list is, is growing. And of course, you go outside North America and there's plenty of other cities doing this as well. And, and by that, I really mean um, measuring and monitoring with, with scientific oriented instrumentation, um, modeling, usually with um, collaboration with academic institutions in many of these cities. And, and some of these are in collaboration with um, city stakeholders as well. So I'm going to now um, jump into this uh, deeper dive, as we'll call it, into urban emissions quantification and the architecture that is emerging to tackle that problem. And what I'm showing here are three pictures that, that is an attempt to show what we're trying to turn into a singular system. Um, and I think it's getting pretty close. In the upper left, and I'll see if I can grab the cursor. In the upper left is the um, Hestia uh, quantification system, which is a real bottom-up, very detailed attempt to quantify emissions at very fine scales, building and street level scale for a whole city. In this example, it's the city of Indianapolis where a lot of this work, at least in the United States, was begun. In the middle is an example of then emissions like that being transported through the atmosphere. And in the lower right are examples of measurement technology. So tall towers with instruments that would be measuring, for example, CO2. And then you can even see an aircraft in the upper left of that lower photograph that will be measuring fluxes as well. And the attempt here is to combine all three of these um, elements of a, into a singular system to potentially verify um, mitigation policy, offer mitigation guidance, in other words, with a very detailed picture and mapping of CO2 fluxes in a city, it would lead to potentially very efficient solutions by being able to target the largest emitters in a given landscape. It's also leading to a lot of science that um, I won't go into, but is very much part of uh, the topic of urban metabolism, understanding cities as kind of metabolic units. This is just a, a bigger example of that bottom-up CO2 inventory, just trying to make the point that in addition to getting a better quantification of whole city emissions and their trends, this type of detail can provide an awful lot of information potentially for cities to target large emitters or portions of a city that might intersect with other interests of policymakers in a city. For example, um, retrofitting buildings in uh, you know, low-income um, building envelope portions of a city. That's a 
small subset of the landscape, but it's important to know the intersection and detail of those two topics. The type of work I've described, this attempt in combining top-down or atmospheric measurements with models and bottom-up inventories, has begun in a, in a number of cities in North America. And the upper left is Indianapolis, the first city that, that I've been involved with that was doing this type of work. Uh, and there's many institutions that have been involved in that, and that's true in all these other cities as well. The upper right is Salt Lake City, where um, similar work is ongoing. Lower left is Baltimore. Lower right is the LA, large LA megacity domain, which has a, a similarly large project, which in addition to some of those measurement assets I showed in that previous slide, um, has an overflight of OCO2. Um, so there's some satellite technology being used in that domain as well. And then, I, though I don't have a picture, um, it's important to recognize Boston, in which there's an awful lot of work going on with BU and Harvard University and city stakeholders in that urban domain, and then a variety of efforts. Of course, outside North America, I've just listed four. There, there are others, but I've listed four that are pretty active right now. Melbourne in Australia, Auckland in New Zealand, Paris, which has had a long-standing effort, and a new effort starting up in Sao Paulo. And as I said, there are others as well. Um, some of this work, uh, at least in the, uh, from that very detailed urban scale, sits inside of this larger flux quantification effort. And I'm going to mention this because we're doing some new things that are relevant to cities from this effort. Um, in some ways, this preceded that very detailed city effort. But it's become so detailed now that it's starting to converge with some of the urban work, even though it attempts to quantify, in this case, um, CO2 from fossil fuel combustion across the entire US landscape. But we're now doing this at about a half kilometer every hour for multiple years. And even going beyond the classic scope one, which is emissions that occur physically within some bounded piece of the landscape, right? So that is not the indirect emissions that might be arising, let's say, emissions in a factory in China given consumption in some city here in the US. These are just the direct emissions in uh, a bounded area. But we're also including scope two at this point. Now, scope two is emissions just driven from electricity production, but allocated to the point at which electricity is consumed, as opposed to where it's leaving a smokestack at a power plant. Now, I'm showing this larger landscape, which doesn't, again, seem like an urban topic, only because we are now carving out, because of the detail we're able to do it, carving out cities across the entire US landscape. And indeed, we now have effectively scope one and scope two inventories for every single city in the United States um, at about this half kilometer scale. Not as detailed as that work I showed you previously, which has only been done in a few cities because of its extreme intense effort uh, to go down to the building level and measure a lot of places. Um, but this is exciting just because we're able to, in one fell swoop, generate an inventory for every single city in the US. And I'm just showing some examples, San Francisco Bay Area, Sacramento, some of the Central Valley. Uh, this is the Houston urban area, Boston and Providence, uh, and a little bit into Connecticut urban areas, the big New York, Philadelphia, uh, corridor, and then finally Washington, D.C. And important just because, as I'll show in a minute, um, cities have expended a lot of effort to generate their own uh, what we call self-reported inventories. That's been an important um, piece of work ongoing, somewhat independent of this scientific effort. But we're hoping to use some of what I just showed you to obviate a lot of that work in the future. Um, now, an important piece of putting those three elements together, the measurements in the atmosphere, that transport modeling, and those detailed bottom-up inventories, is the inversion. And it's, it's really just um, a way that kind of glues, if you will, all these pieces together and tries to get them to be internally consistent by adjusting um, those flux maps to be 
um, consistent with what we measure in the atmosphere. And the atmospheric measurements are crucial because they're um, probably the most accurate thing we can measure or monitor in cities. Uh, and they're a perfect integrator of activity at the surface. And of course, inversions have been done at many, many different scales. And indeed, the work at the city scale is in some ways just a remapping of efforts that have gone on um, for 30, 40 years at the global scale doing this down at the city scale. This is an example. It's a bit of a busy plot. And I'll, I'll just quickly tell you that the punchline here is just the lots and lots of boxes that are off that kind of axis towards the bottom were just different ways of setting up the inversion. It itself has uncertainty in terms of how it gets set up. Um, the kind of length scales you use for influences of measurements and a variety of details that, that aren't so important. But at the top, is um, the kind of central estimate that comes out of that. And the two darker boxes that are off to the left are just two different bottom-up estimates. Um, and in fact, one of those bottom-up estimates is the HESTI uh, uh, estimate that um, is a little bit different from the inversion estimate. And there is an example of where the atmosphere might suggest an adjustment to the bottom-up detailed flux effort from the bottom. Um, but it's important to get those things to be looking at the exact same CO2. And we're still working on this. And this is just uh, an attempt to show some adjustment of those fluxes to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. And the example here is that the atmosphere is going to see all parts of CO2, not just the human, let's say, fossil fuel combustion coming up from the city, but it will see human respiration. It will see a bit of biotic respiration. In this case, that inversion was run over the winter, so we didn't expect a lot of photosynthetic activity. But cities are heavily managed. There's a lot of soil uh, and urban vegetative landscape that respires even into the winter. And so this just, this another busy plot, was just an attempt to show that when we try to include a bit of what we think is those missing fluxes that is different between what the atmosphere sees and what the bottom up estimates, we actually get very close convergence between the atmospheric measurements and the bottom up detailed estimate of fluxes. And in fact, since that work, which was in 2016 and 2017, we've updated our systems. And this is just a very recent example, unpublished work, that shows, and I'm just going to focus your attention on the upper left. Now that's over time. The Hestia, or very detailed bottom-up emissions estimate, is this black line running through. There's a bit of seasonality in the fossil fuel CO2. And now the inversion, the atmospheric inversion, because we've improved our systems, is almost sitting perfectly on top of that bottom-up estimate, something that I think surprised all of us, that we're now getting, at least in this one city where we've expended an awful lot of effort, very almost near-perfect convergence between these very different estimation systems, which means we can go forward with kind of the best of both worlds, the accuracy that the atmosphere offers in the detail and process information that the bottom-up inventories we're building offers as well. And the combination of the two really can give cities an awful lot of information, we think. Now, we've taken all of those urban estimates I showed from that large US landscape in which we carved out all the cities. And a useful and curious thing to do would be to ask, um, since many cities have been doing their own inventories using um, fairly standard methodologies, although there's two or three out there now that are used most commonly. Again, these are very distinct from the intensive efforts that we've been doing in a few of those cities. But if we took all of those self-reported inventories and we directly compared them to the detailed bottom-up effort from Vulcan in which we carved out all the cities, we're finding significant differences between those self-constructed inventories and what we're building through the techniques I've showed you previously. This just emphasizes the point that this, there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done, and I think a lot that science has to offer to, this, um, to the policy and urban carbon management effort, um, because there's still a lot of discrepancy between what cities are constructing for themselves and what we think is actually occurring in most of these cities. We still haven't unraveled why this is, but we have a few ideas.
So with that, I'll stop. Um, and I, here I want to list, um, again, Patty and Stephanie, my co-leads. There were about 15 to 20 co-authors on our Chapter 4. I haven't listed them all here. But I have put pictures of my group members just to acknowledge their contribution to some of the work I've just showed you. And of course, the people that have funded some of the detailed work that, that I just showed you. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. And thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, that was terrific. And you already have some questions. Jim McMahon asks, the recent unpublished data that you just showed, what city was that for? It was for 57 cities. Each one of these bars is a city. I covered it up just because it's not public yet. And typically when I don't cover it, people get a little bit uh, distracted by the exact city. And because we still have work to do um, to make some f um, fine adjustments with uh, you know, trying to make sure we are characterizing each one of those cities fluxes correctly from those self-reported inventories, I've covered them up. But it's 57 cities. It runs the gamut of size, everything from small, you know, smaller places like Boulder up to New York City is sitting on this plot. And those are percentage differences. And I didn't go into a lot of detail, but um, the mean absolute percent difference is closing in on 50%. Um, the mean sign difference is about 24%. Um, so just, as I say, pretty large differences well outside the uncertainty that we think we can estimate city fluxes with. And hence, I think we have a lot um, to contribute. Okay, and you have a follow-on question from Jim. Have Vulcan estimates been compared to any state inventory estimates? Yes, yeah, so we will compare it to the EIA-derived state flux estimates. Um, we're within anywhere from 5 to 12 percent at the state level. Um, there are reasons why we would be different from those estimates. The primary difference is that the EIA is characterizing um, kind of fuel delivery into a given location. And because fuel can move once it goes into that location, Vulcan attempts to capture that fact. Vulcan is really looking at the absolute endpoint of combustion. So we think those differences are explainable by the fact that they functionally are trying to target different things. But we actively compare Vulcan at every scale we can to independent estimates. And then we'll take one more question from Ron Larson, and then we'll move on to Giammi's talk. And then we can take additional questions in the end if we have time. Um, did you also provide your email, right? Uh, We'll provide it, if that's OK. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't think I put it on that last slide. Forgive me. So Ron asks, what are plans to include the reverse carbon dioxide removal? In plans to include it in the, in the bottom up type of estimation? Um, I mean, we're certainly attempting now to include um, vegetated flux, vegetative fluxes in both directions. Um, and if there's any human driven CO2 removal, we would, we would intend to capture that um, in our estimation procedure. We want to, if any flux, regardless of the direction, is occurring within an urban domain, we want to characterize it um, in our information systems. We, we want to essentially quantify every molecule, regardless of its direction within those domains. OK. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. That was terrific. And now we're going to move on to Giammi's uh, presentation. She has the, she developed this 16-part series. I've just been supporting her in a, a Adobe kind of way. But I asked her if she'd do a wrap-up, and she decided to call it Cows, Dirt, Smoke, Water, a State of the Carbon Story. And so here's a little bit of background on Giammi. Dr. Giammi Shrestha directs the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office, activities for the Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group, one of the longest-running U.S. interagency global change research partnerships. Recent accomplishments include a decadal assessment, the second state of the carbon cycle report, which she co-led as development advisor and manager, with a 200-plus multinational team, also serving as a lead editor, lead author, and contributor on multiple chapters over a three-year period. Interfacing with scientists and funders, Giammi supports, conceptualizes, co-leads, and executes carbon and climate change-focused community and interagency U.S. government programs and activities. As part, of, as part of her domestic 
and international portfolios to help catalyze coordinated scientific advances and strategies. Prior to joining the program in 2011, Giyami ac accumulated over 10 years of direct research, management, and consulting experience in academia, NGOs, and INGOs. She recruited and managed research proposal review panels for King Abdullah City for Science Technology via the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences and a Science Technology and Policy Fellow at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, Giyami contributed to research, writing, and review panel recruitment to finalize the landmark America's Climate Choices, Advancing the Science of Climate Change Report. Previously, Giyami led research on pyrolyzed black carbon, carbon sequestration, grazing land management, surface coal mine land rec reclamation, and restoration in the western U.S. In Nepal, she conducted stakeholder analysis and decision support tool development for rainwater harvesting, improved cook stoves, and gender mainstreaming via participatory tech transfer and South Asian energy, water, and gender regional organizations network building. She did this in collaboration with UNEP and Energia and the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. Giyami holds graduate degrees in environmental systems, soil science, water resources, and restoration ecology, and she has served on advisory boards of the University of California and the Nepalese Children's Education Fund. Giyami has just been inducted into the 2019-2020 Senior Executive Development Program of the American Asian Government Executives Network. And on a personal note, um, working with Giyami on this series, it's been a lot of work, but she has been a delight to work with as well as a powerhouse, pulling together information and technologies like loading all the seminars onto YouTube just with a snap. She's just been an awesome co-host to work with. Take it away, Giyami. Thanks, Tracy. That was very generous of you. And, and, and you've been amazing to work with. And I really appreciate that. And thank you, Kevin, for your um, amazing talk also. Um, greetings again, everyone. Um, uh, it, it's been uh, great interacting with many of you uh, uh, participants since February, every Tuesday. So thanks for joining us again, and thanks for hanging on. Uh, the title of my talk um, was inspired by a late night Twitter session with uh, a colleague, Dr. Simone Allen, uh, whom you probably know. Um, her question was uh, uh, related to um, enteric emissions from, from cows and, and whether uh, probiotics could, could help with those emissions. Um, I thought the question was interesting, a bit funny. Um, so you can follow the, that, the conversation on, uh, on my uh, personal feed uh, um, at GAMI PhD if you want. Uh, the U.S. Carbon Program also has an official Twitter Carbon account uh, at U.S. Carbon Program if you'd like to join. With that, uh, uh, Tracy, next slide, please. Um, first, a commercial break, um, a personal carbon story to wake you up if you're uh, falling asleep. Um, I spent the second half of my childhood and early adulthood in Kathmandu, uh, where cows are worshipped and, and rule the roads, where vehicles emit freely. Um, it's a landlocked country where wood burning is the primary source of fuel. Even in metropolitan Kathmandu, we had to resort to wood burning during periods of natural gas shortage. And rolling electricity blackouts were the norm. I was an urbanite, but I later escaped to rural parts of Nepal to conduct research focused on improving livelihoods, first trying to find a solution, solution to continuing nine months of national water scarcity through rainwater harvesting technologies, and then trying to improve the severe indoor air quality impacts on women and children, and helping raise women's financial independence through improved cook stoves, and also an energy and water related women's training of trainers project that I had to launch in remote parts of Nepal. Tracy, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so that was Sorry, I was not looking at the. So yeah, so you'll see some of those uh, interesting photos of. Some of them are the one, are ones that I took. So Tracy, next slide. Um, subsequently, I, I studied larger scale environmental impacts and management strategies 
related to Western USF as coal mine land reclamation, grazing land management for carbon sequestration and, and co controlled burning impact in soils. Um, if you see, like, I am the person wearing the yellow hard hat. Um, that was over 16 years ago. When I first told my US friends that I was studying soils, they called me Dr. Dirt. I was shocked hearing that, that for the first time. How could one call this essential component of life on earth dirt? And above all, I did not want to be called Dr. Dirt. Again, 16 years ago. Now I even used dirt um, uh, in the title of my talk. Tracy, next slide. So after this commercial, I hope I caught your attention. After into my personal cow dirt smoke and water story, let's find out more about what role uh, cows dirt smoke and water play in the carbon cycle. Let's stick for answers in the second state of the carbon cycle report. I will go over some examples um, showing some of those connections. I hope they are helpful. Tracy, next slide. Um, if you go through the grasslands chapter of, uh, of the report, uh, you will see a very nice figure that shows um, connections and, and, and relationships um, between carbon, between management um, of, of native grasslands and different practices. And, and you, will get, you will gain a better, better understanding of, of the um, impact of, uh, of management practices, such as um, conversion to croplands and, and managed pastures um, on the frequency and, and the um, concentration of carbon accumulation in, in soils and vegetation. Dr. Ellis Pendle, who led this chapter, uh, has not yet uh, uh, presented a, a webinar on this topic, but I'm hopeful she will do that in the near future. Uh, this figure shows, um, and also the content uh, in that chapter, uh, provides examples, for instance, how reduced fire frequency in mesic uh, native grasslands has allowed woody vegetation to expand and how it's been associated with rapid increases in carbon stocks in both vegetation and soils. Furthermore, um, th th there have been impacts such as lower carbon density in agricultural lands compared to grasslands that have been observed, uh, and also um, very rapid accumulation of soil carbon in intensively managed pastures. Tracy, next slide. So this is um, a figure modified by, the, by our offspring uh, program, the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry Program, uh, taken from uh, the Socket 2 executive summary, showing um, the uh, carbon cy cycling um, across the air, land, water inter interfaces in aquatic inter ecosystems. Socket 2 um, um, includes uh, uh, like a significant um, advance from soccer one in the sense that different um, terrestrial um, aquatic interfaces were, were differentiated into terrestrial wetlands, inland waters, tidal wetlands, and estuaries, and coastal ocean. And different numbers uh, um, for the pools and, and, and the, the transfers of carbon across those pools were, were derived based on what we have uh, based on what the science has told us uh, in, the, in the last um, decade. So this particular figure shows the exchange of carbon with the atmosphere, um, which is uh, limited to carbon dioxide except for terrestrial wetlands, which also include methane. And the arrows leading from the atmosphere to different uh, ecosystem uh, compartments imply a loss of atmospheric carbon from the atmosphere to the ecosystem as a carbon sink. The carbon sources uh, are shown by the arrows leading from the ecosystem to the atmosphere, implying a loss of carbon from the ecosystem to the atmosphere. And the horizontal arrows show the transfer of carbon between those ecosystems. Tracy, next slide. Uh, again, third example, emissions from cows. Um, so both enteric and 
uh, manure fermentations are the sources of uh, methane emissions from livestock. Uh, and these two sources are affected by uh, multiple factors and they carry uh, different levels of uncertainties. For instance, there is a larger uncertainty regarding uh, methane uh, emissions from manure and the net effects of different intensities and types of grazing. Um, also, this uh, depends on the types of storage facility and the duration of storage and climate. And, and also, based on what we know about uh, the, uh, the projected uh, temperature increases in the future, there will be varied impacts. Uh, there will be decrease in, uh, due to the decrease in dry matter intake of dairy cows, uh, due to heat stress, there will be a reduction in enteric methane emissions um, from the science, from all the scientific um, observations and, and findings uh, that, that's um, described in soccer too. The, this temperature increase is, is, is projected to increase manure methane emissions because uh, of the uh, increased uh, microbial decomposition of manure, producing methane, which is very sensitive to temperature. Tracy, next slide. So wrapping up the Soccer 2 webinar series, um, so the last uh, uh, 15 weeks, uh, a number of speakers spoke. The first one, we, we, um, Jim Butler, uh, who leads the uh, NOAA Global Monitoring Divisions, uh, and I uh, kicked off the series, um, um, and then followed by Sarah Cooley, who spoke of, uh, about the rising carbon dioxide effects on land and ocean. Uh, Grant Donkey and uh, uh, Randy Kolka um, spoke about the recent trends, drivers, projections of carbon cycle in forest and wetland soils. Uh, Reina Jar spoke about carbon cycling in North America's land ocean aquatic um, land aquatic continuum. Uh, Melanie Mays on March 26 uh, talked about um, uh, all about. Uh, she provided an overview of the report overall. Uh, Dr. Richard Bertzi um, talked about the research needs for enhancing carbon dioxide removal. On April 9, Elizabeth Malone, who, uh, who's on the line, um, spoke about the social implications of pervasive carbon. Dr. Nancy Cavallaro, who's also uh, here, uh, she spoke about the state of carbon in soils and agriculture. Dr. Maureen McCarthy on April 23rd uh, addressed indigenous practices contributing to carbon management and climate adaptation. On April 30, Dr. Ben Poulter talked about global carbon budget accounting uh, with the Regional Carbon uh, Cycle Assessment and Process Study, or RECAP2. On May 7, uh, Lori Brewweiler and John B. Miller from NOAA spoke about uh, the atmospheric uh, global carbon cycle. May 14, Dr. Libby Larson um, addressed scientific community engagement for carbon cycle researchers. On May 21st, Rodrigo Vargas uh, um, addressed um, the topic, where does all the carbon go, um, piecing together the North American carbon puzzle from a synthesis of top-down and bottom-up estimates. May 28, uh, Debbie Hunzinger, um talked about uh, carbon cycle projections with a talk titled Future of North American Carbon Cycle. And last week, Dr. Marco Tolio uh, spoke about uh, the North American energy system contributions to the global carbon cycle. Um, so it's been very exciting uh, the last few weeks. Uh, next, I will go over some of the uh, cha chapters and talk about some carbon management and trade-offs and co-benefits uh, uh, described in soccer too. And I will wrap up with the production facts once more. Um, if you did not notice on um, Earth Day, uh, a new version of the carbon cycle, um, uh, state of the carbon cycle report was uh, released. Um, check it out. Uh, it, there's a better search uh, functionality embedded um, in the website, including uh, a full GCIS metadata um, uh, uh, capability and and it's, you'll see we have 19 chapters and six appendices, all extremely helpful and, and useful. And 
uh, thankfully, we were able to include um, um, webinars from each, I think most of the chapter leads handling these chapters. Uh, some of them might be uh, delivering presentations later, maybe uh, in the fall. Um, so SOCO2 addresses uh, how the global carbon cycle is changing, uh, different carbon sources, sinks and stocks in North America. Uh, uh, Tracy, next slide. You can next slide. Thanks. Um, and the effects of um, carbon cycle changes on North Americans and their environments, um, as well as, as providing a systems approach to linking the carbon cycle and society. Um, the projections of the future carbon cycle, potential impacts and uncertainties, and also carbon management and mitigation strategies are also addressed in, in um, each of the chapters. Based on the assessment of science, overall, um, fossil fuels are still the largest sources of carbon in North America, but can be reduced, reduced through dedicated effort. Aquatic systems are both sources and sinks of carbon in North, carbon in North America, depending on type and conditions. And land and coastal waters are sinks of carbon in North America though some things are at, are at risk to diminish or, or to become sources in the future. Next slide, please. The energy sector and transportation continue to be the largest source of carbon emissions. Um, however, the annual fossil fuel carbon emissions uh, overall in North America decreased by 1%, largely due to market technology and policy drivers. Um, in spite of net economic growth over the same decade, cities remain the largest emitters. And the United States it's, is currently responsible for 80 to 85 percent of fossil fuel emissions from North America. Next slide. So, uh, so soils in, in croplands, rangelands, grasslands, and forests have a strong potential for carbon sequestration with improved land management practices, such as afforestation, reduced deforestation, restoration of coastal areas, and terrestrial wetlands. And some carbon sinks are diminishing in, in strength. Many are at risk due to increasing disturbances, such as fires, pests, invasive species, and increasing land use pressure on ecosystems. Conversion of peatland soils account for, for the largest emissions from soils. Furthermore, the accelerated warming in Arctic region, regions ha has been creating a vulnerability of large stores of carbon in permafrost soils. Um, in the future, uh, the projections show that changes in climate, hum human activities, and ecosystem responses may alter future long-term removals of carbon by current land and ocean system sinks. So the capacity of these systems to, to uh, <coughs> absorb and sequester carbon for the long term is projected to decrease. Next slide, please. <coughs> So um, a very significant finding from soccer too um, that was uh, talked about a lot was uh, the estimated cumulative cost over 35 years of reducing greenhouse gas carbon emissions to meet a two degree Celsius trajectory, trajectory by 2050 ranges from one trillion dollars US dollars to four trillion dollars in the United States compared to the annual cost of not reducing emissions is conservatively estimated at $170 billion to $206 billion in 2050. So Soccer 2 demonstrates um, a, a, um, a significant human capacity to, to influence the carbon cycle and understanding this, these mechanisms and consequences can help inform our decisions for carbon management. And, and another uh, 
another um, significant finding is that approaches that are people-centered and multidisciplinary emphasize that, that carbon-relevant decisions often are not about energy, transportation, infrastructure, or agriculture, but rather style, daily living, comfort, convenience, health, and other priorities. So given, given all these um, improved understandings, um, different options to reduce increased benefits of a well-managed carbon cycle are, are described uh, across uh, uh, soccer too, um, around uh, the energy sector, urban areas, carbon capture and storage uh, uh, technologies and practices, land use and land management changes, grazing and livestock management, wetland restoration and creation, and, and tribal lands um, and, and different practices uh, in tribal lands. Okay, so please take a look for those topics. Um, soccer too also delves into different trade-offs and co-benefits of, of uh, carbon management. For instance, uh, the management of wildfire regimes in vegetated landscapes can influence soil carbon storage via management effects on productivity and input of recalcitrant or fire-produced black carbon in soils. And the, the reduction of carbon emissions often creates um, an improvement in air quality, energy use efficiency, increased revenues, uh, economic savings to taxpayers, and a greater crop productivity and enhanced quality of life. So how can carbon cycle science inform different management options? to produce such sustained co-benefits? So we asked this question at the beginning of, of the report and, and we try to answer it um, throughout the rest of the report. Next slide, Tracy. Next slide, please. Tracy, next slide. Thanks. Um, so SACO2 offers a, a solutions-oriented perspective ba based on improved observations over the last decade. Um, so there, there is a separate social science chapter and a separate tribal chapter, and each chapter has a carbon management section. Um, so I, I think we, we did a very good job in trying to better integrate and, and better uh, emphasize natural sciences, sustainability perspective, and, and, and social sciences, and, and a human-centered approach in, in, in our science. Um, and also thanks to the improved uh, observations, the gathered carbon observations, the, 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 the findings in this assessment also show an, uh, an increased um, uh, understanding of, of, of the gathered budgets uh, across coastal wetlands, estuaries, and, and coastal waters. Um, better understanding of lateral carbon transports, uh, which are more consistently determined over space and time. Uh, a better attributed carbon budget overall over North America. A convergence, better convergence between top-down, that is atmospheric observations, and bottom-up or in-situ inventories estimations and also a more robust uh, future projections of, carbon, of the carbon cycle. Um, and there is, a, there is progress in documenting the key elements of the methane budgets. But key gaps and research needs remain. For instance, uh, in the Arctic and boreal regions, um, in the grasslands, tr tropical ecosystems, urban areas, and methane. Okay, and I think I've finally got it out. Um, it's been a three-year journey with over 200 top international experts. Uh, so these are pictures of some of them. So let's remember it's not over. Uh, so again, um, this is uh, a convoluted flowchart, which truly represents the convoluted complexity of the whole process, uh, which started in 2015. Um, but the process was specifically transparent and uh, and, and the participation was very diverse. Uh, there were over six reviews, formal reviews uh, by both government entities and also the public. 
So at the end, uh, the report was chaired by 13 federal agencies and departments of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Um, finally, production facts. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the whole assessment contains 878 pages, um, 19 chapters, 77 appendices, uh, three over close to 4,000 publications were cited, um, 33 chapter leads, 200 contributing authors, five cross chapter leads, and 11 review editors were involved in the process. Um, and uh, and as I said, there were over six formal reviews, including by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and 21 federal steering committee members. Right, so finally, thanks to all team members, collaborators, federal sponsors. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me and check out the website carbon2018.globalchange.gov if, if you have not done that already. Um, and for future opportunities, feel, feel free to reach out to me directly. If you have ideas uh, for derivatives or outreach, uh, you can also check um, our website uh, carboncyclescience.us for such opportunities and, and for more information. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Giammi, for wrapping up that report. That's hard to summarize. Um, folks, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box. You can type them for Kevin or Giammi. Anthony has one. He asks, am I correct in saying that the estimate of the cost of not reducing emissions includes the cost of Giammi or Kevin? Okay, Giammi, that's a question for you. Oh, Giammi, you'll have to unmute. Sorry. Hey, Tony. Um, okay, assuming the a small one. Um, I, I'm not sure about, um, I can't, I think um, Peter Marco Tullio uh, would be better able to answer that question. He's the energy chapter lead. Uh, and also, I think if we go uh, in the, into the chapter itself, there'll be more details on that. Okay, and then we've got, I can give you Peter Marco Tullio's email if you want. Uh, Tony, here, I'll give it to you. Yes, you can email him directly. But Kevin would have a, maybe has a good idea. I mean, I think um, Nancy's right. Um, it's from the energy chapter, and in this context, I don't think it does. Okay. And then Carlo has a question. Do you have experience with Sentinel-5 tropomy greenhouse gas measurements for monitoring? Uh, is that for Kevin? Carlo, is that for Kevin or whoever can? Yes. So we're just beginning to do that, um, at least in the urban context. Um, a few colleagues and myself are just beginning to use tr tropomy. It's clear that there's excellent methane information, but we're beginning to look at some of the other gases as well. Other questions? Oh, Carlos is following up. Oh, okay, he said thanks. And thank by the way, CO being being an important one in that regard, though not considered one of the traditional greenhouse gases, it's um, it has a lot of information content that can be used um, in better quantifying urban emissions in general and greenhouse gases in particular. So I really want to thank Yami for helping to put this together. And Kevin, thanks for joining us and taking just a half half slot uh, seminar for this so that Yami can provide a wrap. If you have any questions, you can contact Yami or Kevin or me, and we'll be try, try to put you in touch with the right people. I have one more thing I want to show you. Uh, we're starting another climate series up next week. 
Um, it's going to be the National Climate Assessment 4. I'm going to be doing that with Katie Reeves of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, Global Climate Change Research Program. And you can see the, uh, here are the talks. It's going to be the same time. Um, and I can send you this list. If you'd like the poster, I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, and it'll be, a, it'll be a different URL, a different link, but we'd like you to join us and we'll be running these through early September. So we're trying to keep the climate cause moving and uh, Katie and Gianni have been great in helping us put the word out on all the terrific science, climate science going on. So Gianni, would you like to, or Kevin, do you have any last words? Other than thank you. Okay, well, thank you. And um, Yami, how about you, since you pulled this all together? Well, it, this was a team effort, so I can't take the credit. <laughs> but thanks, everyone. And um, I think we've, we've all learned, learned a lot throughout the series. And, and we will potentially resume um, the series uh, maybe later in the fall. Uh, there's a lot of interest. Um, so um, I think we've had uh, maybe over a thousand uh, views uh, and, and uh, direct audience participation for this series so far. So it's been great. And thank you so much, Lucy and Kevin, today. We had about 800 people participate directly in this series. And then Yami's had over 600 views on the YouTube channel. So we're getting a lot of word out on this. People have suggestions for how to reach the science journalists. I'd love them to log into this more. So please let me know. Oh, and Lynn Faulkner has a question. <laughs> thank you, Master Naturalist, Naturalist, Educator, and Formal. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you again, Kevin, for joining us. And thanks most to you, participants, for being here for us. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>